Thank you so much. Yes, uh, I had the great pleasure of meeting uh, tonight's speaker. You, you probably know him well. A couple months ago, we were doing a story on some of his research that looked at, you know, historical climate events and how they tie into pandemics, specifically uh, the Spanish flu is what his research was looking at, you know, which is something much deadlier than what we're experiencing uh, right now. And he found some interesting, really interesting uh, finds as a result of that. He is a, a fellow of the Explorers Club, a researcher at Harvard, the Climate Change Institute and LIU and NYC. And uh, he's one of the most sort of quoted and, and media savvy uh, scientists that I've come across, which is, a, is, is like finding a gem. Uh, you know, scientists by nature are reticent. So they don't want to be too dramatic. Uh, and, but he, he is a, a sublime communicator of things that are going on. And so let's bring him in, Dr. Alex Moore. Good to see you again. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. Very, very kind. And thank you, Ann and Richard for uh, your kind words too. Um, so you haven't reported from Maine. Uh, well, guess what? Here it is. Uh, the Change Institute uh, is the, at the University of Maine. And um, much of the data that we'll be talking about tonight comes uh, straight out of uh, uh, the Climate Change Institute, which is a leader, in my opinion, the leader uh, institution in the study of climate change. So as Bill already mentioned, uh, this story, uh, my research uh, made the news and uh, Bill was kind enough to interview me last September and uh, went all around the world uh, in various uh, uh, news outlets, including, uh, uh, I think, 13 different languages. So uh, the, the story came out uh, fairly well. This is the article. It's the top 5% of all research ever. Uh, tracked by Altmetrics and number one in the research uh, journal that we published. Uh, so it's uh, quite an achievement. The statistics, uh, as you mentioned, the Spanish influenza is what we were talking about in this article. And uh, just uh, for everybody to know what we we're talking about, it was an avian flu epidemic, H1N1, that uh, killed about 50 million. We don't actually know, as you know, uh, death rates uh, from a pandemic are difficult to estimate properly, even with uh, today's science. Total infected, again, 500 million, uh, which was one third of the world's population at the time. Uh, we had 1.5 billion people at the time, uh, 1918, 19. And this happened at the end of World War I. In today's population numbers, that toll would be 240 million, which is uh, two thirds of the US population. And the total infected would be 2.4 billion, which is uh, just a number that is inconceivable. So the, uh, this is just to give you an idea of the devastation that the Spanish flu uh, brought to uh, the entire world. And uh, to put in perspective, uh, the various pandemic events that we've experienced, including the one uh, that we have, uh, we are experiencing today. So far, that toll worldwide is 2.7 million with 120 million infected, half a million dead are in the US. That those, uh, you know, the, the, of course, these are smaller numbers, but there are no smaller numbers for those who have lost someone. So obviously perspective uh, goes both ways. We have to be empathetic with those who have lost someone and our heart goes out to them. Uh, our story comes from an unlikely place. It comes from this time capsule uh, that to climate scientists, uh, to all, all of them, uh, is called an ice core. An ice core is a time capsule that uh, captures the atmosphere over, uh, over time. Uh, with, uh, th the way it works is you have uh, uh, various pollution from uh, both man-made and, and uh, uh, also natural, such as volcanoes, uh, dust that uh, just blows uh, with wind up in the air and uh, into aerosol. Again, more man-made uh, fertilizers, more natural sodium chlorine. This is important for later. Uh, sodium and chlorine are salt. They come from the components of salt and they come from uh, water from the ocean evaporating and going into the air. Uh, when the water condenses up in the, in the clouds, it falls uh, as rain or snow and uh, glaciers trap it uh, in uh, this, in ice, in a glacier. And we can go and drill uh, a, a, a cylindrical section of a glacier and get this. And each layer gives us uh, different uh, uh, time frame, sometimes years, 
uh, and that's not unlike, uh, if you want a parallel, uh, a pop culture parallel, it's not like the mosquito and the amber uh, in Jurassic Park, you know, that mosquito trapped the DNA of, of, uh, of uh, dinosaurs uh, from millions of years ago, and then, of course, completely fictionally, completely impossibly, uh, drill in and, and recreate dinosaurs from it. Well, we actually, in reality, drill it, uh, drill the ice, and then uh, recreate the atmosphere uh, from, uh, from it by analyzing the ice. And this is a short uh, uh, video to kind of give you an idea of what that entails for explorers. The team, uh, part of the team was a main, they traveled to Europe with uh, uh, and met the other half of the team on Monte Rosa, the second uh, highest uh, tallest mountain in uh, Europe. Uh, this is the glacier that you're seeing here. And at the top of that glacier is this structure called the Margarita Hut in honor of Queen Margaret of Italy, who was brought up there by Donkey. Uh, in uh, 1907, I don't think she knew what she was up for when the, when she started and uh, baptized the, uh, the site. Uh, this is the, the uh, drill in a dome right at the bottom of the Margarita Hut on the saddle called Polini Fetti. And the drill takes ice core, ice, the ice core out of the glacier one meter at a time, one meter section at a time, 10 centimeter uh, diameter. Uh, that's three feet, by the way, in Imperial. And this is the team. Uh, their names are, are here, and not the most holding to call these photos. That's the key. The conditions are not uh, always uh, pleasant for those who go up there uh, and uh, uh, do science. It is extremely arduous work. Same type of expedition, uh, the Climate Change Institute has led also in Antarctica and um, multiple other places on all continents. The ice core was transported then to a uh, frozen cargo plane and uh, brought back to from uh, Switzerland and to Maine, where uh, atmospheric reanalysis, that is just a fancy word for reconstruction, uh, of uh, what the atmosphere looks like gave us an idea of where the wind is blowing and how we can know uh, what weather, what deposition, what um, uh, what atmosphere the, uh, the ice is trapping, right? So if we're... The way that we, that we detect that is by using a next generation laser that does not melt the ice, it just sublimates it, it just turns a little bit of the solid into gas. You can see it here, uh, this laser just cutting a groove through it. And uh, and then a computer reads it. Uh, this is the team. Uh, it's it's uh, fairly, I realize it's fairly uh, complicated technology. But essentially what I was saying is that the wind and the atmosphere blows over uh, the site, the glacier called Infetti on Monte Rosa. And we know that the, main, the, the, the uh, circulation of the wind goes from north, northwest to southeast, as you can see here, uh, with some intrusions from also uh, the south occasionally. And this is called, this is called the, the Icelandic low pressure system. This is called the Azores high pressure system. There, uh, back and forth, basically controls the weather of Europe. And uh, this gives us the highest resolution climate record on the planet due to the laser technology that you just saw, uh, that it's only available at uh, the Climate Change Institute at the moment. That's your story, uh, Bill. And uh, um, this data, basically, this, this uh, system gives us almost a data point per year. But I'm sorry, one data point per day, 300 data points per year, which is the highest resolution you can have. And we can not only detect uh, atmospheric changes, but we can also ch detect pollution changes uh, in, uh, in the ice. Most importantly, uh, the ice is preserved for the future, so we are not melting it. It's important to note that we are losing a record of climate change because of climate change. Glaciers are melting 
and glaciers are record are a record of what of past climate and past pollution. And without the glaciers, we can't know what's going on. Uh, so in uh, about a year and a half ago, uh, I uh, looked at the data. Uh, we actually, the whole team looked at the data together, uh, but I created this map with Climate Reanalyzer, which is a free tool that the Climate Change Institute offers to anyone who wants to use it. NOAA is absolutely uh, crazy about this tool. They advertise it all the time. It's a fantastic tool to just simply understand how climate works. Uh, it has the most beautiful weather maps you'll ever see. It has sea ice extent updated to today. It's really incredible. And we saw, I, I, what I was looking for was, as you can see at the top left, the years of the Spanish flu uh, in, in comparison to uh, the next two decades. Was there an anomaly during the Spanish flu? Was the weather, was the climate any different? And uh, <laughs> the blob you see here is a low pressure system, very low pressure system, uh, which brought enormous uh, torrential rain and uh, uh, enormously cold uh, weather for, um, for several years over Europe in that period during the World War I and also during uh, the Spanish flu. Uh, this is not a, a, a common map that you get by creating, you know, by, by uh, by looking at uh, uh, the, the climate over Europe. It's a, a highly anomalous map. It's very, very strange. It's extremely low pressure. It means that, and, and we know this from the stories from the eyewitness accounts of soldiers who were fighting the war in, uh, in Europe. Uh, you must have seen photos like these if you've gone to school. Uh, I mean, if you've taken any history class ever, uh, you will know that uh, uh, you will know that the uh, the troops on both sides were fighting in mud. Uh, the trenches were filled with mud uh, or water uh, all the time due to uh, torrential rain and the freezing temperatures. Uh, just to go back, freezing temperatures actually reached as far as Turkey, where the Australian and New Zealand groups, uh, New, New Zealand troops, uh, ANZAC. Uh, were stationed in the uh, Gallipoli, which has had several movies made about. Um, so this situation was uh, added insult to injury, added the insult of climate uh, to the injury of the uh, war. Uh, and as you can see, people were completely used to wading into water uh, throughout the, uh, the conflict. And the water came from all over the place. It came from ponds, it came from the air, uh, rivers that were overflowing. Um, it, it was everywhere. And uh, one of the reasons why we think, uh, although this was not in the research article, uh, Paul Majewski, the director of the Climate Change Institute, uh, and I thought about it, uh, discussed it afterward, and this was really Paul's idea, that um, you, if you look at it, Europe, Still today, you will see it pockmarked by bombs uh, from World War One. This is one of the uh, most famous uh, um, uh, battlefields of uh, Europe and uh, on the Somme, and uh, the pockmarks are bomb craters. All of the dust that was kicked up into the air and and made into uh, an aerosol, so just you know, uh, kicked up into the air. Uh, at very high altitude sometimes, most likely caused what we know as uh, nucleation. Nucleation is when, uh, happens when um, droplets of water, uh, particularly water vapor in the atmosphere, uh, come together around, uh, drop, uh, around uh, particles of dust, uh, just grain, very small grains of dust. Gen you, you might wonder why water, which likes to form droplets in general, uh, doesn't do that on its own, and it's it does, but it also it, it, it does uh, it, it also comes apart at the same rate. The um, the dust is really the the key ingredient that creates and makes the droplets happen and uh, increases the chances of rain. It is uh, very likely that in fact most of the dust that we kicked up in the air by bombing uh, uh, Europe at in, in this. Uh, in this way, 
during the conflict uh, increased the chance of precipitation, uh, increased in fact uh, precipitation overall. So uh, how does this affect the pandemic? Um, this is a graph that I recreated by looking at the government records of 13 different countries, uh, translating uh, the records week by week. Uh, these are the deaths, from overall deaths all throughout Europe. And uh, there are some trends there, uh, some up and ups and downs. And this is what precipitation, that is rain, looks like. And the Spanish flu is right here. And you can see here a double peak. And this, I promise, is the only graph you're going to see. Uh, <laughs> and... Uh, here you can see the double peak and the double peak in deaths and a double peak in uh, precipitation. So there's clearly an association between uh, the deaths, top right, red, and the, uh, and the precipitation uh, in blue, in the, the rain. Uh, so more flooding definitely affected um, deaths. And that may, would make sense even if we didn't have a pandemic on our hands, because uh, uh, not only does a uh, cold climate uh, uh, weaken your immune system, as many articles have shown, uh, grandma wasn't totally wrong when she said, uh, the, uh, you know, put on a, a coat, you're gonna catch a cold. Uh, cold does in fact depress the immune system. It does in fact, uh, in fact, we've seen it with COVID, uh, colder temperatures uh, uh, have increased a chance of uh, transmission. Uh, but uh, it, we also have uh, multiple secondary infections that occurred during the, uh, the, the war uh, where people got uh, a trench foot, they got um, uh, you know, uh, all sorts of other diseases, uh, secondary infections uh, during the, the war. But of course, in this, this, uh, this anomaly lasted for four years and uh, uh, it peaked really with the period of the Spanish flu. And how do we explain that? Uh, well, first of all, we see that uh, cold precedes peaks in, okay, I lied, it's a second graph, uh, precedes peaks in mortality almost always. Uh, and then uh, we know that these fellows carry H1N1, where they're one of the major carriers of H1N1 uh, virus or the Spanish flu. In fact, according to an article by the Royal Society, uh, they reached 60% infection rates in, uh, in uh, autumn or the fall, as we say in America. Um, the, chick, the chicks, particularly of mallard ducks, reach 60% uh, infection rates. And, uh, you know, as all of, all of the pandemics, and this is absolutely crucial, all pandemics humans have experienced have been caused by uh, uh, an animal vector of some kind. Uh, it's, they're called vector-borne diseases. They're, uh, they're, or, you know, the technical term for it is zoonosis. Uh, this, this happens all the time. Uh, it's, it's uh, I don't know, it's a misunderstanding or I don't know how many people think that, that animal diseases are not going to affect humans, but that's totally wrong. Animal diseases affect humans all the time. COVID is an example. Um, what happened then uh, was that the uh, low pressure system, the big purple blob that I showed you earlier, interrupted the migration pattern of uh, mallard ducks. Uh, in the uh, year before and uh, year after uh, the outbreak of the flu, and uh, uh, particularly in, in the fall and in autumn, uh, these uh, guys most likely uh, reached, and not only mallards, it could be any other bird uh, really, uh, reached uh, an infection rate uh, as usual, uh, and that water of 60% and that water that they infected, uh, we know that uh, continues to be infectious for a couple of weeks. And as you saw in the photos before, uh, the, the everybody was waiting in it. So, uh, you know, they were, they were swimming in, in the trenches and, and water bodies that were connecting. So, oops, 
Okay, you're gonna get to see the animation again, which is pretty. Um, so why is this important overall? And I'm, I'm gonna keep it fairly short. Uh, why is this important overall? Well, it's important because migrations are happening constantly in our environment. Uh, as you can see from this uh, fantastic uh, animation by the Nature Conservancy. Uh, blue is birds, uh, I think uh, pink is mammals and yellow is uh, reptilians. Uh, this is the, the central, uh, South America. And you can see where the, uh, where the migrations go. And with migrations go the diseases of animals. Uh, the animals don't leave them behind. This is what the Northeast looks like. And this is, by the way, why we get uh, so many beautiful birds in, uh, in Central Park and not so many in Boston, uh, where I am right now. Although we did get uh, snowy owls, that was on the news today. And uh, in fact, we see that bird migration uh, has been connected to West Nile virus, Lyme disease, influenza A, which is, uh, uh, and other pathogens. So in fact, this is happening. Uh, and it is something that we should be aware of as we change the climate and we also change the um, environment in which animals live. As the Audubon uh, magazine remarked, uh, the birds could actually predict the next pandemic. And this, this article actually came out the same week as mine uh, in uh, September during climate week. Uh, but currently, the technology used to track these viruses is very uh, analog. That is, it's people sticking Q-tips down poor birds' uh, bills to figure out uh, what, uh, what viruses they're carrying. Uh, and I'm hoping that in the future, uh, I will uh, be able to uh, set up a, a project where we, we are able to track diseases as climate is changing. I'll show you some examples of that. But the bottom line is that if we want to prevent future pandemics, we need to ban wildlife trade worldwide right now. The problem is that uh, we are using wildlife and we're using nature for our pleasure and uh, advantage. I don't even want to know pleasure. I don't even want to say pleasure because I can't imagine selling an animal for pleasure, but some do. Um, and this is causing their diseases to jump to ours. That is the most likely cause of the coronavirus uh, uh, pandemic um, and uh, is most likely uh, the cause, it is the, the cause of several other uh, epidemics that are currently ongoing. Uh, Ebola came from monkeys. Uh, we have, um, you know, mosquitoes carrying Zika, whose uh, range is increasing over and over, ever more as we change, as climate changes. So mitigating climate change and protecting wild places will reduce human wildlife interactions uh, so that, you know, we are not in, in very close together with animals, say rats carrying plague, for example, as uh, the other great pandemic of history, the Black Death, uh, as in that case, um, you know, if we reduce the human uh, animal interactions, I'm not saying you can't look at animals, I love animals too, just, you know, from a distance in their environment, um, and reduce the, the change of infectious diseases, uh, that should say the chance, that infectious diseases jumping from animal to human. Uh, this is an example, by the way, in the Northeast, where uh, some of us sit. Uh, this is a, a an anomaly uh, of uh, temperature. I think it's temperature. I can't see because the yeah temperature anomaly. Uh, and uh, the blue indicates in 2017, so same year, indicates all Lyme cases. Uh, now, if you don't think that we are changing our health, by uh, by changing the climate, then I'm just gonna show you that again. There is a correspondence that is uncanny. And if you live anywhere in the Northeast, you know it. You know the deer are dying because of ticks. You know the moose are dying. They're called moose, ghost moose because of tick invasion. We doubled the summer uh, in the Arctic in the last 20 years 
That's insane. That's uh, the equivalent uh, abrupt climate change, which, by the way, was discovered at the Climate Change Institute at the University of Maine. Um, that's the equivalent abrupt climate change uh, that the whole world experienced and as they came out of the last ice age. Uh, we just did that to the Arctic, and it's happening more and more to the rest of the world. And as we warm this area, we uh, have more ticks, but we also have more fly, uh, mosquitoes coming from the south. So it is urgent that we actually uh, uh, think about uh, climate change and about mitigating it, uh, voting for people that believe in science, and, and actually dislike saying believe. It's not a choice. It's science. Uh, it's not a religion. So let's think about how uh, pandemics also affect climate for a second, uh, and then uh, we'll go into questions. Um, last, uh, last March, right about now, we saw this, 14th of March, this map was shown of uh, uh, pollution over Europe, uh, over Europe, particularly Italy, which was having a really bad uh, time with it, uh, with COVID and the pollution around Milan and all around the agricultural areas in, uh, uh Northern Italy, uh, decreased, uh, spectacularly due to the pandemic. This was not unpredicted, unpredictable or, or unprecedented as the favorite word of 2020 unprecedented. It was not unprecedented. We, uh, uh, predicted it in 2017 in an article that I'll show you in a second. Same happened in China, by the way. And this article, we actually in this article in this in this plot, we actually showed uh, only once in the last uh, 2,000 years uh, pollution, lead pollution particularly, which is uh, very easily trackable, went down to natural levels that is undetectable levels, which is natural. We shouldn't have. And that was uh, 2017. We predicted the future. Uh, we predicted that this would happen during a pandemic. Um, and we also have predicted that, uh, so we better listen, <laughs> um, that uh, with climate change, we're going to have stronger siren dust storms and siren dust. Uh, this was actually covered by The Guardian uh, two days ago. Uh, sarin dust uh, can have PM 2.5, uh, you know, implications of two, PM 2.5 pollution to cardiopulmonary disease, uh, meaning, you know, small little particles that uh, get into your lungs and get into your bloodstream uh, can have enormous effects on your health. And uh, that happens, uh, you know, with, uh, with dust storms like this one that we saw in February. And also we saw one last June, 23, 23rd to 26th, I believe, uh, when the sky got uh, became orange over Europe and, and across the Atlantic, all the way to the Gulf of Mexico. This work was uh, uh, um, first authored by our graduate student, Heather Clifford, uh, who, and here you can see a photo of the dust actually covering a glacier in Europe, another uh, impact of climate change that is um, darkening, making darker the snow as, of course, if as something is darker, it melts faster. So there is a, a it's called a positive feedback, but there's nothing positive about it. So um, bottom line, uh, and really last uh, slide, uh, you know, the, 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 the conclusion is that if we keep, if, you, if we take care of the environment, and we take care of animals, we will also take care of ourselves. The uh, problem so far has been, and this is called the One Health Principle, uh, the problem so far with our, our economic system and the way that we think about nature, even conservation, has been to think about um, uh, nature and animals as uh, something that you can put a dollar sign on. And that dollar sign is gonna give you the value of those items, those things in your life. And in fact, uh, how do you value your health exactly? I mean, the US government gives a, a human life uh, a value, uh, so do insurance companies, but really can any, any one of us uh, in, in good faith say that you would be comfortable giving a value for human life? And if you can't, then you can't put a value on uh, the environment either or on uh, animals. I Either because guess what? Their diseases can jump to us. 
and the lack of uh, wilderness will cause those animals to move into our uh, environment and our urban environment and uh, make it more likely that pandemics will, uh, or epidemics or disease or uh, will, uh, um, will uh, emerge. And we wanna avoid that. So um, we have to take care of climate. Uh, we have to mitigate climate change and we have to protect nature in order to do so. And we have to do so outside of our normal uh, concepts of uh, uh, conservation and uh, uh, environmental economics, as it's called, uh, that evaluation has to be a much more, uh, uh, much broader, a much more holistic uh, view of uh, what of this interaction. Uh, we think that we are, as humans, we have been taught by even by religious texts that we are here to dominate nature, and time and again we've been. Uh, 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 proven wrong. Uh, the, the system is so complex, ecosystems are so complex that as scientists, we have realized that the only real way to ensure that uh, public health, person, our health is preserved is to ensure that the health of the entire environment is preserved. Nature likes balance and uh, nature has been around for a lot longer than us. And it's figured out that balance uh, a lot earlier than we even uh, 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 than, than when we even appeared. So it's, uh, it's important to think about this. I think it's also important to look back at this case where one third of the world population was infected and you know, uh, 50 million people died um, and take some heart that we have made progress and we are uh, today still together, although uh, in a virtual way. Uh, in order to protect our, each other and uh, protect ourselves. And that has made enormous difference. Uh, so science is in fact uh, helping us through the crises like these. And I hope that if you think about that, that change, you know, you could have lived in 1918 and <laughs> chances of death could have been a lot higher. Uh, so today we're, we're not all uh, we're not dying by uh, that type of percentage. And if you think about that and you believe uh, medical science, I hope you do, as Anne said, wear a mask, uh, then why not also believe and actually trust, uh, what's just the right word, uh, climate science as well and, uh, and uh, environmental health science, which is what you saw tonight. That's the thought I leave you with. And uh, we can go back to uh, chatting with uh, Bill now. Uh, that's so fascinating, Alex. Thank you. I, I'm, it was poignant. It's scary. Uh, and so much came to mind as I was watching. I was just reading today about these massive dust storms in China right now. Uh, Beijing, the sky is, is yellow, uh, a dirty yellow. And it used to be a lot worse uh, until the Chinese spent billions of dollars on reforestation I tried to avoid desertification that was happening. And who knows if, if, if they left those landscapes alone, if the source bat or civet cat or whatever gave us, you know, uh, COVID-19, it's so much cheaper and so much uh, safer to prevent these things before you have to go into to fix it mode. I, I have questions. The questions are coming in now, but I, I had a couple that, that jumped out to me and I was trying to do my research on these zoonotic uh, diseases that SARS came from bats and palm civets and MERS from camels and Zika from monkeys, Ebola, as you mentioned, from bats, swine flu, though, from pigs. How much should we be concerned about agricultural production, uh, especially in the United States, when it comes to these kinds of, of diseases? Uh, well, I'm going to answer that question uh, first by saying that most uh, uh, cattle production is one of the largest contributors to climate change because they produce a lot of methane. Cattle particularly produce a lot. Cattle is beef, uh, <laughs> mostly beef, uh, produce uh, a lot of methane. And methane is 80 times worse than CO2 uh, by... Um, uh, as, a, as a greenhouse gas, uh, at least at the beginning. Uh, it, it dissipates faster than CO2 uh, in the atmosphere, but it does have uh, an enormous effect. 
So reducing cattle production, reducing farm, uh, uh, animal farming is definitely a, um, uh, a plus in that respect. Look, there are a number of epidemics, out, disease outbreaks that have been controlled, uh, but have occurred of, um, that have come from uh, farm animals. You can't deny that. Uh, and I mean, down to ones that we still don't know if they're happening or not, like Reutzfeld Jakob or uh, you know, mad cow disease, as we uh, uh, call it. Um, so, uh, and there is, for example, uh, an encephalopathy um, uh, running rampant in Northeast uh, among horses, uh, which is another, uh, another case. So it really, it, 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 it is a concern, However, I think there's a lot of monitoring of those uh, industries, contrary to the wildlife trade. The wildlife trade is completely unmonitored. Uh, as I showed before, uh, I'll just uh, share the slide for a sec, also because I wanna show the group again, but uh, just these are, these are the figures. It's 23 billion uh, illegal trade and 20, 127 billion legal wildlife trade, nobody's testing these animals, most of these animals, especially the illegal ones, for uh, diseases. That's not just not happening. And, uh, you know, those animals end up in people's homes as uh, aquarium pets, uh, as, uh, uh, you know, terrarium pets, as all sorts of things. Uh, you know, it, it, it's somewhat, um, it's somewhat uh, ironic. I'm just going to leave this here for a second to give credit to my colleagues who are wonderful and without whom none of this would be possible. Um, you know, if you, if one of the perhaps funny things about the pandemic is that one of the uh, most uh, uh, popular shows of the pandemic was about wildlife trade uh, at the beginning of Netflix. I'm not going to say the title, but you all know what I'm talking about. Uh, but it is, uh, you know, it, it was absolutely disgusting and nobody's making that point. Uh, you're taking these giant felines, you know, these giant animals, bringing them over, uh, breeding them. Uh, you know, white-tailed deer are also, we also have to think about that a lot of these animals can be susceptible to our diseases. And as they are, uh, here's a, a slide that I kept for, for later, just in case, uh, you know, Minks, remember minks? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we had to call, they had to call them all. Uh, they, calling is just a nice word for killing. Uh, all the minks in, uh, I think, Denmark and a few other countries because they're uh, susceptible to coronavirus and we were worried about um, mutation. Anytime a virus ends up in another animal or another person, it can mutate because it, it interacts with the viruses that that person or, or animal already has. Like a, like a, I don't know, like a melting pot, if you will, and, and new strains uh, come out. Most of them are uh, don't don't infect anybody, but uh, they some of them do. Uh, the other one that we don't uh, we haven't heard a whole lot about is uh, white-tailed deer, which is everywhere uh, now due to lack of wolves, uh, which have never killed anybody, uh, but we killed all the wolves, and now there is a ton of deer, and they're spreading, and they can be susceptible to SARS. Uh, COVID-2 and therefore create new strains. Uh, I can show you what the strains look like, uh, but I, I want to listen. I want to uh, go back to the questions. So yeah, we got a bunch of them coming in fast and furious. I'll ask sort of the basic ones here. Kevin McCary wonders, how do birds pass viruses to humans? So uh, in many ways, uh, the most common is through water. They're um, they, a lot of birds like water, uh, and I mean, they have to drink, first of all, but also a lot of them, especially the waders uh, and uh, the, the, you know, uh, water birds like ducks uh, live in water. And when you live and eat and do other things in water, those other things end up in the water and contaminate it. Uh, and uh, tests have shown that uh, the water is contaminated for up to two weeks. And that water makes its way into, uh, you know, water sources that we are spoiled in America thinking that all our water is disinfected and, and wonderful <laughs> in most places. That's not the case, as you know, from your travel. Yeah. 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 I was up in uh, Alaska doing a story when they found some of the first cases of avian malaria 
uh, up there, tropical disease. Uh, Peter wonders, what are the units used for deaths um, on your charts? Was that per day or was that, I guess that was uh, per 100,000? It was per week and per 100,000, yeah. Per week, 100,000, okay. Um, have there been any major ocean animal-based uh, transmissions from ocean animals? Good question. That's one that's near and dear to my heart. Uh, we have seen a lot of uh, um, what they what NOAA calls uh, uh, unusual mortality incidents among whales, particularly in the Northeast, and some have been uh, associated or suspected to be uh, associated with uh, human uh, human diseases. Mm. Um, nobody, to my knowledge, and I, I don't know everything, uh, uh, but. Nobody, to my knowledge, has made that uh, clear and uh, actually proven it. Uh, we do know that some whales are, in fact, sus susceptible to uh, SARS-CoV-2. Wow. Coronavirus. Uh, Luna wonders, uh, what makes uh, Mount Rosa the place of choice for extracting those ice cores? Good question. Uh, it's not just the Monte Rosa, but that particular um, spot has a low accumulation uh, spot that essentially produces, without getting into much of the details, produces very high quality ice and uh, has not suffered from uh, warming as much as other sites. Okay. Um, Mara writes, Alex, I'm from Cambridge, Mass. And when I was a child, there were no wild turkeys here. Now I'm back and they're roaming in droves on <laughs> Snow Drive. Uh, this is from climate change, right? She asks. Uh, I'm actually not sure that that's true. Uh, I, I, I think uh, there were uh, turkeys here before and that we wiped them all out. And uh, uh, that, you know, there were a, a lot uh, more, a, a lot less restrictive gun laws uh, for a long time until uh, uh, Massachusetts and Cambridge in particular became very restrictive, restrictive about it. Uh, so I, I, and, you know, if you have a gun and you see a, a turkey, uh, um, it's, uh, you know, it's more likely that that turkey is going to be dead. Um, so I, I think that that uh, that's really the major change. There are also no predators. That's the 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 overall change in America is that we removed all the predators. We removed wolves. And if you if you don't know what wolves have done to the to Yellowstone when they've been re reintroduced, uh, you you're nodding, you know it, right, Bill? I mean, yeah. um, they have changed rivers, they they have changed the they changed rivers. salmon oh. populations, it's changed it's salmon incredible. populations, yeah. uh, reduced uh, not drastically but reduced controlled uh, deer populations, uh, and as a result, they would reduce disease because if ticks don't have a lot to eat and they eat deer or dear blood, uh, then, you know, wolves would be our friends. I, I don't know why uh, there is, again, no historically documented wolf attack that killed anybody ever. That's just, that doesn't exist. I looked for it because I wanted to, to, to understand why did we, but, you know, there are, there are governors that have been filmed while campaigning uh, shooting wolves from a helicopter. Yeah. Uh, so, you know. I remember her. Yeah, yeah. and it's the, and our, all of our dogs came from them. That You know, they, they learned to make eye contact before, <laughs> before all the others. And there was just in my home state of Wisconsin, they brought back uh, the hunt and they hit their quota, I think, in half a day or something. And so much of this, I was thinking as you're talking about it, it's so it's so cultural, you know. We talk about climate change or loss of biodiversity as these scientific things that happen in a vacuum. It's culture, and whether it's a, a, a voodoo market in Togo, which I've been to, or the bush market, or, you know, the, the, the wet markets in Asia, or here in the United States, like you say, our you know Little Red Riding Hood uh, convinced us to kill the apex predator. Um, yeah. Let's see. Uh, let me ask you from a UN, I hope I pronounced that right, UN Kim, cold weather increases the chance of transmission because of the temperature or due to the indoor shared air transmission? Both, uh, both. So temperature has been found to, uh, to 
uh, weaken the immune system. We say depress in public health, it depresses the immune system. Uh, but it is a potentiator uh, also is not a word for it. Sorry, just jargony a little bit, but basically it means that it, it increases the chance of, uh, of uh, infection. Um, why? There are multiple reasons uh, why. Some of them we understand, some of them we don't. One of the, the easier ones to, uh, to, to know, to understand is that uh, our nose has, has all sorts of fluids in it. And those fluids, you know, leak out when you're, when you're cold and, you know, they do, all, all, they do their business and they clean out our, our, um, our, our nose. So you could have a particle of a virus, any virus in your nose and not have an infection because it just, you know, dribbles out, doesn't have time to actually uh, hold on to that, uh, to your nose. However, it's all about viral load, right? Um, as we've learned from uh, Dr. Fauci, um, if that, if the inside of your nose is sticky and uh, cold and uh, it doesn't, run as easily, let's put it that way, uh, then the likelihood that a virus can stick into it and, and create a, an infection or work its way into your body is higher. That's as simple as I can put it, uh, essentially. Uh, and, and cold does that. It, it gummies up uh, your, your, uh, your nose and other parts of your body. Uh, but it also really uh, does affect the immune system in ways that we don't entirely understand yet. But we have seen uh, that, that this happens. Uh, and uh, so we see, for example, people who, have, who are perfectly healthy, but maybe are carrying a bacterium or two, uh, or two, one, one kinds of another or another. And uh, that bacterium all of a sudden blooms uh, and becomes an infection. Is it because this person was exposed to somebody? No, it's just that uh, they, they were in a cold environment, their immune system was depressed, weakened, and uh, um, that, that bacterium or virus had a chance to reproduce and, and create a, 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 an infection. The same can be said, uh, so the, the other answer, the other reason that, that, the, question, that the questioner brought was, uh, you know, people spending more time inside, certainly. Yeah. Yeah, Together. kind of a follow up on that. Mark Friedman wonders if cooling is responsible for the flu, how is warming responsible for COVID or is it? I never said that. Oh, <laughs> I don't yeah. think so. I don't think I ever said that warming is cold. I, I said that our uh, deforestation and our, our, our wildlife trade and, and re, you know, the, the um, raping and pillaging of nature is really what we're talking about. Uh, you know, with uh, uh, lack of control and any any lack of measure whatsoever, is going to reduce what first of all reduce wildlife uh, space for wildlife habitat, right? And and then it's going to use wildlife as uh, uh, as uh, something to trade, and those are both incredibly dangerous uh, uh, for pandemics. So you don't have to listen to me, listen to every other epidemiologist, every other uh, environmental scientist, every other anyone who's had an experience with it. Climate change is the ultimate uh, habitat reducer because it is, you know, just look at the wildfires, uh, how much uh, a forest is being uh, burnt in, in, uh, in California. Uh, and how much less, um, you, you can see the, this slide very quickly. I actually have that slide. Uh, how much less uh, habitat is there? This is, these are all the, the wildfires from last year. We're talking about, uh, you know, 4.1 billion acres of wildlands that burnt in 2020. That's not available to uh, animals to live in. Where are those animals going to go? And um, this, by the way, the green part is our 40% of our fruit and nuts. 40% of our fruits and nuts are in a ring around the ring of fire. Well, I have a ring of fire around them. So um, climate change is the ultimate uh, risk for uh, reducing habitat of animals. And as a result, uh, animals are going to end up in our, 
in our habitat, in our urban area. Right, right. And the tragedy is that fire is such a part of that landscape if it's natural, right? And we you know, suppressed it. We've had these fire droughts and so on exactly. all at once. Yeah. We don't like stuff when it comes all at once. Exactly. This we had a lecture a about that during Climate Week, which I hosted with the fire chief from that area who said exactly what you said, Bill. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but then logging companies want you to think that if you let them go out and do their thing, they'll prevent uh, fires. Yeah, and also a lot of people want to live out there in the woods. And I, I, like I said in September, look, I love li being in the woods. I just don't live there, uh, you know, in hundreds of miles from any any civilization so that then when there's a fire, somebody has to come and suppress the fire in order to save me, one person, when, and, and do it over and over and over again on a large scale, and you're suppressing all the natural fires so that when it happens all at once. So uh, what the fire chief, the bottom line for the fire chief was get the heck out of the woods. <laughs> <laughs> uh, speaking of, I mean, fire uh, killed 2 billion uh, creatures in Australia this last year. Uh, James Churchill wonders, since we know Australia and New Zealand have been extremely successful under quarantine, given they have some of the strictest wildlife and fauna enforcement in the world, would you consider them the example to follow going forward? A lot easier when you're an island, especially New Zealand at the bottom of the world. New Zealand is, uh, has been an example to follow in a lot of respects, uh, uh, COVID policy being one of them. They, they, they hacked it fairly easily and fairly quickly um, compared to everyone else. Australia, I I've actually worked in conservation in Australia and I have many friends who do. And I can't say that the conservation policies of Australia have been the strongest. Uh, I'm just gonna put it there that, that, you know, so I wouldn't use it as an example in some cases for sure. And they certainly ha have had private citizens and private organizations that have led the way, but I wouldn't say that uh, they're the greatest example. I think the Great Barrier Reef is possibly the uh, most glaring example of something that should be saved, you know, a large multi-billion dollar economy, if you want to put it in a dollar sign. Uh, I, I hate doing that, but, you know, it's sometimes the only way. Uh, it's the only animal made object visible from space. <laughs> it's the largest structure out there. And uh, it has a biodiversity that is, is incredible. All of us love it when we see it. We see it uh, even on Finding Nemo and fall in love with it. Guess what? 80% of it bleached in 2016. I was there before and after. Yeah. Uh, it, it's absolutely tragic. We knew that. We told that to the, uh, you know, and they're still, they're still selling coal like, you know, there's no tomorrow. So quite literally, there's no tomorrow. And at the same time, uh, I was just reading that the government has taken, it's sort of like, who has a good idea on how to save the Great Barrier Reef? They, they got thousands of submissions. They're putting money into about 140 ideas, some of which include uh, creating like 3D printing prosthesis for the coral or pumping cold water at enormous cost to try to keep this thing alive. That's where we are yeah. uh, on this. Uh, yeah, I mean, and by the way, geoengineering, which is what this is, uh, is just not the way to approach climate change. Uh, I mean, there, if you ever hear geoengineering, you hear people are talking about, you know, pumping sulfuric acid in the, in the atmosphere because, it, you know, we can basically uh, reproduce a volcanic eruption that, that reflects uh, light. My team and I actually have worked on uh, past examples of that. Uh, you know what you get when you pump sulfuric acid in the, in, in the atmosphere? You get acid rain. So you got a famine afterward because it, it drops on, you know, it, it rains on on land, and then you you've got no food. Also, ocean and the ocean is acidifying and bleaching coral way way faster than we can we expected due to uh, uh, CO two. So if you add sulfuric acid to that too, then bye bye coral reefs for sure. Right. Uh, Gabriel says it's my understanding that most, if not all. Zoonotic bird diseases come from domestic ducks, chickens, and parrots. Are there any proven cases of flus other than of other diseases from wild birds? I, I mean, I, that was that avian malaria thing I mentioned, but that didn't. I don't think that transfers to humans. But what do you think on that one? There are. Uh, I recommend this article right here. 
if you want to screenshot it, I don't know. You guys uh, are watching at home, but this is a film. Oh, the Audubon. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, that uh, tells you exactly um, how many viruses are in wild birds uh, today and how they're being tracked. It is uh, the work of, uh, of, you know, it's it's some of the most monumental work I've ever heard of. It's incredible. It creates, it takes enormous dedication, uh, but it's out there. Yes, there are, there are wild viruses out there. Right. Um, John Kotchkis says, hi, Alex, since we have such a large issue with the international wildlife trade, how can we control or reduce the trade in the U S especially in more problematic States like Texas? Uh, yeah, I, I believe the stat is there are more tigers in cages in Texas than there are in the forests of India. Yeah, uh, John is actually in Texas now, I think, uh, is a friend of mine. And, and uh, uh, he has actually worked uh, in wildlife conservation, so he knows very well uh, what he's talking about. And, and uh, um, the, here's, here's the thing, uh, when a year ago, and two months, I started teaching my environmental health course uh, in New York City. Uh, I wanted to figure out what coronavirus was like everybody else. I read it on CNN, uh, uh, yeah, I think it was January 25th, something along those lines, uh, or 26th. Uh, and uh, I found this uh, CDC, I believe it's CDC uh, order to ban all civet cats import and it was from, I want to say 2014. Uh, I might be wrong by a digit. It could be 2004. My mistake if I am. I'm sorry. Uh, but why? Because they found uh, SARS-CoV-2 <laughs> uh, yeah, variant in it. Uh, and that was why, by the way, we immediately went to Civic Cats when we first thought about or they rather, uh, but we as a country uh, thought about what the origin could be because that was the next uh, closest var variant uh, that we had on record. So we know very well that uh, uh, there is uh, uh, Ill illegal and legal trade of wildlife, of wild animals, not domesticated animals, not animals raised for trade, which shouldn't do it anyway if they're wild animals. Um, and uh, the CDC did ban it. You know, you know what impact that had? It had an impact on those who eat the coffee that civet cats eat. And you know what I'm talking about, and I'm not going to into the, the details. They're really gory. Uh, but, you know, it's a luxury trade. That's all it is. Right. Uh, who did it affect? Five people who want their coffee with a certain aroma? I mean, That's seriously? And, and the, the threat was to the entire country. Uh, so that ban did exist. We can ban things. The government, the, we have a federal government that contrary to some, uh, the opinion of some does regulate <laughs> things. Uh, and it can, we've done that before. We can do it again. We regulated chlorophyll carbons, you know, the spray stuff that made the hole in the ozone out of, uh, out of the world and probably one of the most, uh, uh, famous and uh, uh, successful climate uh, atmospheric uh, agreements in the world, the Montreal Protocol. Mm -hmm. um, so if we can do this, it just takes a will not to be as greedy. It's all it is. Right. Um, Arnaldo wonders, are we weakening our natural immune system by overprotecting ourselves with masks when they are not needed, like walking on an empty beach, for example? Nope. Totally the opposite, totally the opposite. Uh, masks have in fact uh, uh, been proven to accumulate some virus particles and s sort of exposing us uh, at a, at a, in, in, a, in stages to, to uh, various viruses, including SARS-CoV-2, um, creating, some have argued, and I'm waiting for the reproducibility on this, that, that more, more, more studies, basically. Uh, but some have argued that that has actually had the effect of, a, of, of you know, creating more defenses against uh, the virus. So masks work in, in a number of ways that we think we know and a number of ways that we still don't know, but they work uh, for sure. And uh, you know, I remember being on the New York subway in March last year 
and being told don't wear a mask. It's not necessary. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I've just thought about that moment and how many people could have been saved if we just uh, come out and say, okay, now everyone do like uh, lots of countries do in Asia, wear a mask on the subway. Thank you very much. Uh, until we figure out what this is. Right. Um, so no, masks work. There is no argument against it. Uh, if you're alone on a beach and you don't want to wear a mask, don't wear a mask. Uh, if you're alone on a beach, but uh, you know, there is some such a thing as leading by example. And if, you know, even there are people around seeing you without a mask that creates a, a it creates a domino effect. Well, he's not wearing, I'm not gonna wear it. And, and that causes problems because not everybody's gonna be careful as you are uh, about not being close to somebody else when you're not wearing a mask or you know, checking the wind <laughs> where it's coming from. Right, right. Let me ask the most uncomfortable question for everybody who wants to get back to normal. Uh, without pointing out, it was normal that got us into this situation. But uh, there are other cases, like if I understand right, West Nile was first emerged like in the 30s and then reemerged 60 years later. And then you've got all these new ones you've, you've talked about. Mm -hmm. Do you think life in this uncertain, you know, the, the, all the commercials say in these uncertain days, it's really our uncertain lifetime. Do you think masks will be, become sort of a permanent part of, uh, of the wardrobe? Boy, oh my God, that is the most uncomfortable question ever. No. <laughs> but it, all right. We're going to get all, all no, all, all the people on the, online are going to want to murder me. Um, no, it's, it's fine. Uh, about May of last year, uh, Kistler, uh, Harvard's public health, school of public health uh, scientist, uh, published an article in Nature or Science, Science, sorry, Science. Uh, saying that essentially SARS-CoV-2, COVID, would become um, much like the flu, uh, especially if there were variants. Uh, and because, the, because of the variants, we would have more and more vaccines, boosters, just like we have flu shots every year. Um, and I see that prediction as bearing out uh, so far. Uh, it seems that we're dealing with more and more variants. And I just want to, because I like eye candy, as you might have noticed, uh, I just want to show you what and where where variants come from. You know, um, you all, uh, you know, I'm, there, are, there are all sorts of people who are making arguments about masks. Um, the more people get, uh, the, the more people exposed to COVID, the more variants we're going to have. It's that simple. And this is uh, the, the, uh, Phylogenetic tree. This every dot is a is a sequenced uh, genome of SARS-CoV-2 of coronavirus. Okay, and uh, here look at this over time. This is over a year. This is what we have seen. Wow. Okay. Wow. Yeah, and uh, look at it on a map. It starts in China. And the more the more colors, the more strains. Okay, it's just a kaleidoscope everywhere. Yeah, and, and you know Europe in particular, where masks are very weak, uh, and uh, less in Brazil, less in. So in fact, you know our booster shots are actually going to have to be uh, nation specific, often, uh, which is why different nations have different policies right now. And now I can show you what another disease like, say, uh, what did you want, uh, West Nile? See how much simpler? Right. A lot fewer people got it. And you can see how it's clustered around the United States. Interesting. Uh, it actually does start in, I believe, yeah. There you go. So um, when you have um, when you have states taking masks off uh, for no reason whatsoever, uh, then you have a lot of people exposed to the, the virus. And even if they're healthy carriers, they're, that virus is still meeting other viruses and saying hi and you know going for tea in their in their in their bodies and and creating more strains. Some of them will be infectious. Some of them will not. But the reality of the matter is that until we stop this thing in its tracks, 
we got to keep our masks on. And that's just as simple as that. Uh, and, you know, uh, I don't think it's a huge sacrifice to take care of our neighbor. Um, I, I don't know, seems odd. Uh, I've worked in government. I worked on healthcare policy. And I know that uh, that is not always the case everywhere. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, just imagine that your neighbor is you. Don't you want that? You know, treat others as you'd like to be treated. That's the rule. I find so much that, that the parallels, I, I keep saying this is sort of the opening credits for the climate, you know, full-blown climate crisis and the communities that wait for their citizens to start dying suffer the most. And those that have this best shared sense of both rest reverence for science and sacrifice are the ones who come through this, as we talked about New Zealand. Um, this is an interesting sh question from Lou Tolman. I've tried to, to discover why the Spanish flu disappeared mysteriously after two years. Could you help solve this? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, I do want to win the Nobel Prize someday. <laughs> uh, I don't actually. I don't. I could not care less. Uh, now, the 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 reason the, the answer is simply we don't know. Uh, when you have one third of the world population infected. Again, I put a tilde in front of it, you know, a little wave in front of 500 million. We don't actually know. There was no test. Wow. Uh, you know, so can it's possible there was herd immunity. Uh, it's possible that herd uh, immunity means everybody actually got it. Everybody was actually uh, affected by it. Some developed the disease. Some did not at all. Some died. And, uh, and then, you know, everybody was immune uh, after that. It's also possible that the virus mutated into something less, less uh, virulent or less uh, deadly. Uh, but there are strains of H1N1 still around. Uh, it's, not a, it's not completely disappeared. There, there are different strains, different versions, uh, but they exist. Yeah. Um, Luna, we don't know when an earthquake happens, when a volcano, a volcano erupts. These are things unknown to us. What is the major unknown in climate research? I'm going to steal that one and say human, human nature, human activity. Basically, yeah. Uh, basically, that's the most, uh, I mean, you know, the Earth's climate system is incredibly complex. We've got computers over computers and software trying to figure it out and um, ice cores to me are the gold standards. They are to uh, the Climate Change Institute and uh, my Harvard colleagues at the Initiative for Science of the Past uh, and uh, LIU. We're, we actually created this, this, uh, this collaboration to figure that out, uh, to figure out those, those systems. And they are extremely complicated. But to some extent, to some extent, you can always find a probability, uh, some form of pattern. Human nature, <laughs> I mean, what policy, you know, what, what countries will actually do, well, you know, uh, electing one or another leader that completely disregard, disregard science uh, for two, four, six years, depending on what country you live in. Um, that's that's really the unpredictable uh, because, you know, if you have a country that's got 320 million people like the United States or a country like what a billion people like China or India, uh, that makes a difference. If, if policies are not implemented, you know, if people start burning fossil fuels and, and buying fossil fuels and nobody stopped really uh, without, without uh, that's, that's the most unpredictable thing. Right. Enormous impact. Right. Yeah. You're totally uh, right, Bill. I argue that um, the two people that hold really the fate of life on earth in their hands more than any is President Xi of China and Senator Joe Manchin of West Virginia, who's that swing vote in the Senate. And it's scary to think about it. It comes down to that, but uh, you're right. Uh, so uh, that we've kind of reached the end of our questions, although Drudy yep. uh, Dronzik says, if you are in the USA, please contact your political reps and tell them you support Preventing Future Pandemics Act. This is uh, uh, House Resolution 151. So apparently there's something out there. There are, there are politicians listening to your warnings about these invisible enemies and how they, you know, uh, go outward. Uh, well, I mean, this is why we do, we do talks like this, right, Bill? And, and it's why you report 
uh, your reporting is way, way more impactful. And, you know, it's, that's, that's why it's so important to communicate. That's why it's so important to have uh, evenings like this. That's why, you know, uh, the mission of the club is so important uh, because uh, the, you know, the, we try to make the science, un, you know, as, as plain as, as daylight to everybody uh, so that everybody can make an informed decision. And uh, I, I don't know, I, I don't think I'm too partial. I'm partial to word science, but to me, part of science is not uh, political. <laughs> In fact, the best thing that can happen to science is to get the politics out of it. Exactly. Hey, let's make science boring again, <laughs> but not, <laughs> not completely, because we have to we have to heed the heed the stories and warnings. I, I gotta have a job. <laughs> you gotta have a job. Yeah, uh, Dr. Alex Moore. Thank you so much. You know him, you love him. Thank Here you so much, Bill. Club. Thank you for uh, spending some time with us uh, this yeah, evening. Yeah, anytime. And uh, anytime. I don't know if I'm taking it back to Anne to say goodnight. Uh, otherwise, or Kevin. Or Kevin. But thank you so much, everyone, for coming and have a great night.